before we get started here, I'd like to remind all of the uh, presenters to click your talk button before you begin to talk. We'll be ready to go in just a moment. Well, I'd like to say good morning to everyone. Uh, it's, it's morning for us anyway. Welcome to this webinar entitled Driving Adoption of OER Through Communities of Practice. I'm Charles Key, Director of Adoptions and College Open Textbooks for Open Doors Group. Open Doors Group is a collaborative of educational, government, nonprofit, and for profit entities. We seek to expand access to available, affordable education for all learners. College Open Textbooks, a project of Open Doors Group, advocates for awareness, adoption, access, and affordability of open educational resources, focusing primarily on textbooks at the two-year college level. Communities of Thank you. Communities of practice are mutually supporting peer groups organized around a common academic discipline. We believe that communities of practice are an important factor in the OER equation. They have the potential to facilitate production, peer review, and adoption of professional grade OER. Today we have a distinguished panel of educators representing four communities of practice sponsored by College Open Textbooks. Each will provide a unique perspective on how the community is driving adoption of OER in their respective disciplines. As we hear the various presentations, we encourage you to submit questions via the chat window. We hope to have some time at the end of the presentations to answer some questions. Before jumping into the presentations, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Margarita Sasser, one of two senior managers for communities at College Open Textbooks. Margarita? Hello, this is Margarita. Hopefully you can hear me okay, and thank you, Charles, for that introduction. So uh, as Charles mentioned, I am one of the community managers for our College Open Textbooks community. Uh, for more information on this community, we are also listed as a resource in this Open Education Week online forum. Um, but basically what we are, we are a online community, uh, mostly educators, people who are focused around open textbooks, people who develop them, who use them, or people who just want to learn more about them. Our initial focus was on the US uh, use of open textbooks, but over the past couple of years, as this movement has expanded globally, we now have an increasing number of members across the world. Uh, we also, our initial focus has been on the community colleges, but we also are now seeing some members from four-year universities as well. Um, today, we are about 1,600 members strong uh, for collaboration. Some of the things, some of the content, some of the highlights that are on our forum includes um, listing of upcoming open textbooks and related OER events. We do have links to some past event replays, discussion threads, and other resources. It is an online forum where you can share best practices, lessons learned, post questions, and solicit feedback. And we are starting to introduce some groups. And this is a focus area for us going forward. The idea here is to have more targeted groups focused on specific subject areas such as US history, algebra, business communication, and others. And our goal going forward is to foster these groups, increase membership, and increase collaboration among educators that are focused on very specific topics. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself, Margarita, or my partner, Kathy Hooper. And as I mentioned earlier, we are also, there's more information listed on the resource section of this forum. Thank you, Margarita. We want to move now to our first community of practice, which is water technology. I'd like to introduce Regina Blasberg and Mike Alvord, both who are active at uh, College of the Canyons in Santa Clarita, California. Regina. Hi, Charles. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about our water technology program. 
Next slide, there we go. The structure of our program is that every student is required to do 21 units, which is a total of seven courses. Five of those seven courses are mandatory. Uh, and they include two water math courses, a water supply course, a water quality course, and an introduction to water systems technology course. We feel that every student should have that as a basis. And then their final two courses out of the seven may either be beginning and advanced distribution or beginning and advanced treatment courses. Um, most students tend to take all four of those, but the only two of them are required towards either the degree or the certificate. We offer both an associative science degree as well as a certificate in this program. We offer our courses in multiple formats. Um, we now offer this program as a 100% online program. So for those students who are unable to access a community college near them, that has a water program, they could take our classes. Uh, they could complete the whole series online. Additionally, we find that many of our providers, they are running 24-7, and so sometimes we have folks that are on a late shift or a graveyard shift that would be unable to come to our evening classes, so they could also participate online. Um, we do occasionally offer some hybrid classes, and then, of course, we offer the program in our traditional delivery on ground as well. The focus of this program is for water operators. We strive to prepare our students to take and pass the state licensing exams, uh, the T1 through T5 and Z1 through D5 licensing exams here in California. We have, I think, a very unique community of practice. As a career technical education program, we do work very closely with our industry partners. Um, Mike Alvord, who's also speaking with me here, he'll be jumping in momentarily. Uh, he works for one of our industry partners, and we have a number of them who support our program, help guide us in our curriculum, and our goal is to produce well-trained students and productive employees who can pass their licensing and be uh, effective and productive employees for our partners. In order for this to happen, we need to make sure that education in the water industry is easily accessible and at a low cost. Many of these folks cannot afford to pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars every semester for textbooks, and we felt that this was a really great opportunity to provide uh, a low-cost option through online textbooks. Our program has one full-time faculty member, that's me, but my time as a full-time faculty member is split between this program and three other programs as well. And then we have, right now, two part-time faculty, Mike being one of them, who are uh, a, a very important part of our program and do a lot to support this program. So our community of practice includes our industry groups as well as our students and faculty. Our problem has been that the cost of textbook and materials continues to increase. We use a number of texts from the American Water Works Association, uh, specifically for the one, one of our math classes. The basic science concepts book was $146 directly from AWWA. Our bookstore, of course, will put a markup on that. It becomes incredibly expensive for our students, and that's for one course, not including their tuition costs. The quality of the materials, although AWWA, American Water Works Association, has great content and great knowledge, uh, these materials aren't always set up for instruction. So our instructors typically have to do a lot of work to create alternative materials, alternative handouts, um, demonstrations, tests, exams, homeworks, projects, all of that. So we felt that perhaps it would be better, especially with us going into a online program, that we provide better access to materials that better suit the teaching needs of the program. Okay, I'm going to let Mike jump in here and talk about our solution because he has really, really been super supportive and instrumental. In 
Yeah, what? thanks, Regina. Um, the state exams that these water operators have to take. Uh oh, can everybody hear me? Something just cut out. Um, I'll continue talking, but I don't know if anybody's hearing me. Um, our state exams that the, the operators are required to take is uh, a portion math and a portion of just water knowledge, whether it be water distribution or water treatment or such. Uh, and the, um, the water math portion, the 030 and 031, is the introduction to math and then the advanced math. And it, it takes uh, the students all the way through uh, distribution and treatment exams, one, all the way through five for their certification. The Water 03 class was originally developed back in the mid-90s, and it was a um, home-completed text that uh, Dr. Jim Gates had developed. And when I took over the class, the, the book was sort of outdated, and students kind of complained that there wasn't any means of um, allowing edits and revisions, because I, I didn't have access to that book. I only had a printed copy of it. So I went out and decided to, along with Ravina, she helped me develop a book for 030. And it went over really well for this for the class. It allowed students to um, participate in the edits, um, allowed them to add content, and it worked really well. Then when I went in to develop the advanced water class, the only book I was using was that $146 book that Regina spoke about. And it really didn't work. Um, there were some topics that weren't covered. Uh, there was just, it was sort of cumbersome. It wasn't um, organized in, in a matter that kind of was fluid to the course. And so we decided to create a book for that as well. And I completed that, uh, the and I completed that about a year ago. And it is following the exact same um, progress as the 030 book, and students really like it. Um, they're able to give me give me comments, they're able to um, provide me you know, whatever edits. Somebody else in that I'm going to turn my volume down. Um, and the students can print it directly themselves. Um, the campus has a uh, uh, print shop where they allow, um, they'll print it for a, a nominal fee, and I think it's just a couple dollars. Uh, or even some students, I find, don't print it. They just have it on their iPad or their tablet or their computer, and then they just keep their notes in a, in a um, uh, spiral notebook or something like that. And so it kind of works for anybody um, and, and uh, all the different ways that they want to learn. You can go to the next slide. So what, um, and Regina, you can jump in any time here. What we've determined that the average savings is about $5,250 for each student, um, well, to the students for each semester, um, based on the number of students that we have. Um, the revisions are easy. I have it all on, on my computer. Um, and sometimes I'll even make revisions during the class, uh, during that semester, and then provide um, prints for the students, or I'll just upload those pages, PDF to Blackboard, and they can print them out. So it, it, it's immediate updates and immediate edits. Um, and if there's any sort of major additions that have to happen, that'll be for the next um, uh, the next semester. And then, really, the last important part is providing the students the answer key. Uh, a lot of times. Textbooks either have just the odd numbers or the one that uh, we were using, that um, AWWA book, didn't have any answers. And so I would have to go through and, and solve them out and then provide those to the students anyway. And so now this um, uh, book that we provide um, has the answers for all the questions and the, and the way they're solved. I don't just put the answers, I put the, the actual solution of each math um, problem. And it, it really seems to help the students. That's about it for, you know, we thought we didn't have a lot of time and wanted to give a quick overview of what we're working on. Um, so, I don't know, are we doing questions now, Charles, or later? Um, 
we so far don't have any questions, uh, but we have a few extra minutes left on your on your time. If you want to expand on anything, uh, please do. Otherwise, we'll move on. I'm I'm good. Mike, okay. Okay. Good? I'm good. Great. Thank you both very very much. An interesting program, and I think a great use of the community of practice. We want to move now to our next community, which is Hello. developmental mathematics. Um, I Hello. would like to introduce Donna Gaudette from Stock Scottsdale Community College. Hey, Charlie. Hi, everyone. Just, uh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. It looks like we did end up with a question. Did you want to address that now or wait till later? Um, Donna, if you'll hold, why don't we, why don't you go ahead and address it right now since we've got a moment? Okay. I would say that our community of practice is a little bit different than some of the others. Under the career technical education umbrella, it has been really difficult to find online materials that are suitable and well reviewed um, and meet the standards you know, that we need to maintain educationally. So our community of practice is expanded a bit, as I mentioned early, to include our, our local industry partners. You know, our community is now more than just here within the college. It actually, we bring in industry into that community and discuss how we're going to deliver content, what types of materials we're going to use. And they have been exceedingly supportive of our online efforts and moving into online textbooks because they recognize that for their staff, who many of them work crazy shifts and their systems are running 24-7 in the water industry, that in order to maintain employees who are happy and well-trained and can advance over the long term, uh, they need an educational system that will support their unique environment in industry. And we're able to provide that through um, these online efforts. So our community of practice kind of extends past the college to include industry because they are the consumer of what we put forth. So Rick, I hope that answered your question. Um, well, Mike is in industry. He works for us as a part-time faculty, so in, in many ways, yes, uh, we do get feedback on our materials because very often, in this case, they are generated by our industry partner. Um, Mike's boss and his office is supportive. Mike can probably speak to that better than I can, but they're very supportive of our efforts here and our educational efforts. You want to jump in there, Mike? It, I don't want to talk about you like you're not here. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll add a little bit. Um, I actually have my Distribution 5 certification, which is the highest level in, in the state of California, and a Treatment 3. And so I have taken a lot of these um, uh, exams, and I pull my knowledge from those exams and put them directly into the textbook. Um, I've also worked for the California Nevada AWWA uh, and have done some instruction for them for LADWP, Metropolitan, and a lot of these surrounding uh, water companies. And I also ask students, after they complete an exam, to come in and talk with me so I can structure the questions um, more appropriately towards those exams. I've also done a little bit of work with um, California Department of Public Health in terms of their subject matter experts. Um, you know, I have to stay very specific in terms of how I write my questions for the state versus how I teach my students because I can't give them the exact questions that are on the exam, but I can at least structure them so that the content and the material is representative of what they're going to be getting when they take the state exams. Mike, I need to break in. I think we need to move on. Okay. Thank you very much. We go now to Donna Gaudette from Scottsdale Community College. Super. Thanks, Charles. And um, I enjoyed hearing about Mike and Regina's efforts. We have a water wastewater program over at a, at a community college, and I don't think they know anything about open resources. So I'm going to pass them on to what you guys are doing. I think that's great. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a developmental mathematics community of practice that's evolved here at my institution. I'm at Scottsdale Community College in Arizona. And um, we started our efforts really 
with hybrid classes. We started teaching hybrid classes about uh, 2008, 2007, 2008 time frame. And our classes normally meet two days a week here at our community college, so our hybrids meet for half of the seat time. And we quickly realized that the materials that we were using, the regular publisher textbook and all, did not provide enough resources for the students during the out of class time because we were moving half of the class time to be their responsibility. And so um, we ended up creating for the hybrids a lot of videos and support materials, activities and things like that. Um, that's kind of where it started. And then at the same time, these are kind of independent efforts, some faculty started uh, finding out about OER textbooks through uh, organizations like CK12 here in the US and started bringing in open source textbooks for their students. And then some other faculty also heard about, started investigating an online assessment tool that was free. Because we were using my math lab at the time, which was through Pearson, and it was starting to become more expensive for the students to have access to that. So these were kind of initiatives that were all going on separately in our department. And then in the spring of last year, two of our faculty members said, hey, we have all of these pieces that we think we can put together into a learning system for students that doesn't cost them really any, any money. And so they put together, um, the, they combined the student workbooks that we've been creating with open source textbooks, with this open source online assessment tool. So all the pieces were kind of in development on their own. These two faculty took them, put them together, had a successful pilot in spring of 2012. And then in the summer, got a big team together and said, let's roll this out for our entire developmental ed curriculum, which for us is arithmetic, introductory algebra, and intermediate algebra. So those three courses lead students into their first college level required mathematics course. So what happened in the fall 2012 was we went completely open source for all of these courses. And that involved going from two instructors using to 42 instructors, including full-time and adjunct. We had 65 sections that used the materials, um, the whole system in the fall. And we figured that we saved about $182,000 in student textbooks just in that one semester. And what I want to really talk about here is this amazing um, community of practice that has emerged. So like I said, we were doing things individually as often faculty do. You know, we kind of put our heads down, we get done what we need to for our classes, and a lot of times we don't always realize what's going on even within our own department. So when we began to pull together on these different efforts, we had to pull together the people that were working on the different pieces. So the people that were developing the student workbook had to work with the people that were developing the online assessment tool, and they had to work with the people who were working with the textbook to be sure that it was a cohesive presentation for the students. And so the community of practice formed with not only our full-time instructors that were teaching and working on these classes, but with our adjunct instructors as well. And so what we were able to do, I believe, was to produce materials that were at a much higher level than a single individual could do alone. Because, for example, um, the student workbooks emerged out of a series of handouts that were used for our hybrid classes. So the handouts began to be put together into a flow so that they could actually present our required competencies from start to end. And so rather than just have a series of isolated activities, we began to incorporate um, exposition and explanation so that it started to look more like a textbook along the way and pull those pieces in between for students so they could help make the connections. Um, and so now we don't have a community practicing calculus. This is just with developmental algebra. And so, like I said, the community formed from the need to create these materials and make them open source. 
So the communities were not really around individual topics, they were more around projects. So the student workbook group formed with the assessment group combined with the textbook group and then all began to work together. What was interesting is that as we began to work together, the, um, the strengths and weaknesses of the individuals on the teams became apparent. For example, um, I am, uh, my strength is in writing materials and in recording videos. And so I kind of took a lead role in writing a lot of the workbook materials that we have for the three courses and in recording the videos because I was able to develop a process that worked pretty well. Other folks didn't have that as their strength, but we have some folks who are fantastic editors. So after I would write the materials and my other colleagues would write, we would pass that on to the editors and then they would go through it. Because what we found was that you cannot, well, we weren't able to do it. You can't develop materials in a group setting. In other words, you can't have 10 people trying to write a lesson. You, you really need um, a team that is a writing team, which is one or two people, and then they take that, they pass it along to a feedback team where people look at it, give suggestions, it comes back to the writers. So we found that particular process to be um, very good in terms of pushing along our objectives because now that we've created these materials, we have to keep them going and that really does require a lot of sharing and a lot of working together as a team. So some tools that we use along the way that we found critical. One is a way to share files and that we use Dropbox. There are other tools you could use or you could use a shared server space on your, at your institution. But I liked Dropbox um, because I didn't have to go in through my institution through a, like a VPN or something when I got home. I could just go right to Dropbox. And it was critical to share updated. I mean, we have hundreds of files that we've shared back and forth. And so having that tool was critical. Having an online site where people could discuss things, talk about errors in the materials, et cetera. And then one way that we really, really involved our adjunct faculty last semester was we had meetings every two weeks as we went through the semester to talk about the materials, the different aspects, places where they needed training, things that were working well, things that weren't working well, et cetera. Um, and as far as resources to do this project, we really were very limited. We had a little bit of funding, um, thank you Charles, from the um, COT Adopter Communities Grants. So we got a little bit of funding so that we could provide the um, printed materials for our faculty. And we have used that in the fall and the spring and we'll use that until it runs out. And then we got a little tiny bit of money from some local grants um, that we had in, internally to help develop some of the materials. But mostly uh, I have to say it was a labor of love and those of us that got a little money probably got like, you know, a penny on a penny per hour by the time we <laughs> got through with it. But I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, the thorns and roses of a, a huge project like this, and it is ongoing. I mean, I'm working right now on materials for the fall, um, updating and keeping things going. And so the thorns in my mind is that the development time does take, it is a lot. I mean, we, you essentially become a publishing house or a distribution house for your materials. The maintenance and updates are things you have to keep in mind in terms of time and planning. Distribution was a huge issue for us with our bookstore because they weren't real thrilled about distributing our materials, um, our free materials initially. And then getting a buy-in from adjunct faculty we thought was going to be way more difficult but they really jumped on board and, and what we did with our rollout was we said these are your options for materials and our options were only open source. And so they said okay, we'll figure it out and, and then they really worked with us and gave us a lot of feedback. But way more roses than thorns. Um, the money we save for students is amazing. The community that has developed this whole community practice that's ongoing even now has really sparked our department and given us a lot of energy. We have a tremendous amount of support from our um, department and administration on campus as well as at our district level. And having these materials around this whole new system has made us think differently about how we're teaching this content how our curriculum, uh, what our curriculum is like, and then I think working as a team has helped us make the product 
way better than if we'd had just a bunch of individual folks working on it. So I highly advocate this community approach to development um, because it's going to give you a much better product and it's just a whole lot of fun. Um, with the bookstore, it, that was a kind of a, um, that was a challenge, but what we eventually did was we were able to work with a, a publisher, a local publisher that would work with the bookstore and we were able to get them to agree to distribute the books if the publisher gave them like a 30-day return policy on any books that didn't sell, which they did. I was surprised that that publisher would do that. But we sell the books in the bookstore for um, its print cost only plus, of course, the bookstore does their 40% markup. So, but the student can get a workbook, printed workbook for like $17 or $16 as opposed to a $110 textbook with their um, my math lab. So that's been a huge improvement. And they can print digitally. They can print, um, you know, it's a free access to digital. And then they can print if they have access to print. Um, so I'm coming right up to the end of my time, but I want to take questions if there uh, are Donna, any Rick other questions. Donna, Rick McKinnon put one in uh, into the chat about the uh, any release time uh, for this. You know, uh, we did not get any release time. Um, initially, what we're kind of negotiating with our administration now, and we've had those discussions recently, is that, you know, my big thing is, you know, faculty can do individual OER efforts, but if there's not a structure at the campus to support the and maintain the OER efforts, they will fall apart just because people get tired of doing it all the time. And so what we're experimenting with this semester is sort of an OER coordinator position for each of the classes because there's so much involved with, you know, making sure you have the right edition, getting it to the faculty, all of that support. And that is um, the equivalent of two, two load hours of, re of release time. Donna, I'm, I want to move on now and uh, release you to um, maybe answer a few questions in the chat window. Thank I'm you so much for this great presentation. Thanks, Charles. Okay. Um, we're moving now to our third community of practice, which is American government. And we have Miria Holman, who is at uh, Florida Atlantic University and uh, Boca Raton. And uh, Miria, it's, uh, it's all yours. All right. Thank you very much, Charles. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, American government texts that we developed for our students that take American government at FAU, uh, FAU is a large public institution. We have about 30,000 students. And we have between 1,500 and 2,000 students a year that take American government from our department. And so uh, we, we being me and uh, Tim Lenz, who was the chair of our department, and a few other faculty in our department, who, could, who taught American government uh, thought about developing an open source textbook for our American government class, and we did so. <laughs> um, and uh, the grant that we got uh, to improve it was really to improve it. We had an existing text, uh, and we worked on the ancillary materials and revisions based on a peer review of that text. Uh, and this included uh, things like putting together a really detailed text, text bank, uh, putting together PowerPoint slides associated with each chapter, and putting together uh, materials for Blackboard, making sure the whole thing was ready. Uh, we decided as a department to, to do this and uh, to provide the text to fr as an e-text for free to our students. And so far, it's worked really well in that our students really do like having a free textbook. And uh, the university itself has become a very positive partner in this. The provost's office gave us some funds to work on the text. And uh, we got the graphic design department to, to help us with some of the design elements of the text for free. And as a whole, the university has really started to look at textbooks as one of the places where we could produce real savings for our students. We have a student body that often struggles with paying their bills. Uh, we have a, a lot of non-traditional students 
We have a lot of first-time uh, college students. We're a minority-serving institution, and we're a veteran-serving institution. And so each of those groups of students are our university is very cognizant of the need to provide low-cost services to them. So as part of this, uh, we developed um, a department policy that all of the American government classes had to use this e-text as their primary text. This was a very positive step because it uh, forced us to actually get the text into working condition fairly quickly and it really incentivized the revision of it. We used uh, surveys in Blackboard to our students that were using this text to look at how we should be redesigning it in the areas where we needed work. This was paired with uh, recommendations from the external reviewers. And so we used some of the money that we got from a grant and some money from the provost office to actually hire students to produce a lot of the ancillary materials associated with it. And then um, we have been using it and revising it for uh, about two years now. Uh, we are in the fifth semester of use of it, if you don't count summers. Uh, seventh semester, if you do count summers. And so far, it's all working really well. Um, a few things that we learned that are really important, and I think this will echo uh, some of the other comments. Um, it's very important to uh, have somebody sort of in charge of the community, but then have wide buy-in in the community. Uh, so that person started out being me and now has gradually moved to Tim Lenz. He used to be our chair and now he's not the chair anymore, so he has a little bit more time uh, to work on this. And it's very important to do that because you need sort of one person to be monitoring the additions of the text and making sure that everything is working at and all the links work and that kind of thing. We also found it very useful to encourage student involvement in the text, both in hiring students to work on improving the text, but also using surveys and routine evaluations by students to improve the product. The students got really excited about being involved in sort of the production of this text. They were very impressed by the idea that we were writing uh, writing a text specifically for them, and they really uh, enjoyed giving us feedback. Uh, we had one student that went through and you know turned in uh, something like 55 different small comments to us <laughs> about the text that they things that they thought that they would uh, they'd like to see changed. And then the other thing that I think is very important is to engage in some level of uh, self-promotion, uh, particularly within your university community. Uh, this is important because admi the administration doesn't just automatically know what you're doing or automatically understand why it's important uh, what you're doing. Uh, so we did some cost estimates about our, you know, what we thought our students were going to be saving by using this text. Uh, you know something like $150,000 a year was going to be saved by um, students using this text. The university was very impressed by that. Uh, and it you know, got our attention from the, the administration, positive attention on our department. I'm an assistant professor. I'm a tenure track assistant professor. So it was important for me to have this text considered a publication. And so by uh, engaging in peer, getting a peer review of the text and getting the administration on board, uh, I was, I was allowed, I'm allowed to count this as a publication on my CV. So those are sort of my big lessons. Um, you know, have somebody in charge, have a good buy-in in the community, sorry, and uh, really encourage student involvement in both improving the text and also uh, getting the students to use surveys, routine evaluations to improve the product, and then get the university to uh, acknowledge what is important about what you're doing and why it's important. 
Uh, and in particular, I make sure that administration understands the value of these of these open source texts and what exactly the students are getting out of it. Uh, so I'm I'm happy to take questions. If anybody has questions, I see a couple questions on the on the side the chat, or uh, I can take other questions. Uh, Miria, thank you. Why don't you um, go first to the questions in the chat? Sure. Uh, so, uh, in terms of the number of faculty contributing to this text, we have six different faculty that uh, contributed to, to some extent to the text. We had three primary authors of the original text, but then three other faculty have used the text and have suggested changes as uh, they have used the text, things that they would like. Um, one of the things that we developed were these PowerPoints to go with it, and that was a request from one of the instructors in our department that used the text. Instructors in our department teach a uh, heavy course load with no research expectations, and they are often the one that, ones that teach American government classes. Uh, and so it was really nice to get some feedback from them about what would make their job easier in terms of implementing the text. And then in terms of uh, the level of student participation, um, I don't want to say 100% because it's not 100%, but all of our, everybody that uses the text is asked to administer a set survey via Blackboard two times a semester to students. They, most of the faculty offer some extra credit for participation. Some of the, some of the uh, instructors require the students to take to do the survey. It's a pretty it's a basic 15 question pretty lightweight survey. But we do get a lot of responses from the students about uh, the text itself, the usefulness, things that they would change. And then uh, I sort of identify when I teach American government I always identify a group of students that seem a little bit more engaged and we've done focus groups with students that are a little bit more engaged about things that they would change with the text and then we hired about five students to uh, work on uh, the text in, at different points in time. Um, we communicate ongoing changes. We have a we use Blackboard, and so we have a shared Blackboard group that contains a master copy of the text, and you change that master copy when you want to change. And we have it set up so it's synced with uh, the Blackboard e-texts that are being used right then. So uh, changes are communicated via that process. Um, this was one point where we sort of got IT involved in terms of what the best way would be to do this. And we ended up just using a folder on Blackboard that is synced, that has the text in it as the way to do it. It was sort of the simplest way that uh, we, I could handle not knowing tons of stuff about how Blackboard works. Uh, so we have the, this master in a shared Blackboard community, and then that syncs to each each individual faculty member's uh, text in their Blackboard class group. Are there any other questions that anybody has? Thank you very much, Miria. I appreciate it. And we will move on now to our final panelist uh, of this session. We have Lisa White McNulty, who is a professor at the University of St. Francis in Juliet, Illinois. And she represents our educational psychology community of practice. Lisa? Lisa, I'm, we're not hearing you, at least I'm not. Um, I see that you have the microphone, the talk button clicked. Any luck now? Yes, now we got it. Okay, great. Okay, let me start over then. <laughs> Uh, very quickly, our group, unlike the other groups who've, um, the other communities of practices 
who are presenting today, our group is scattered all over the country and even into Canada. We found each other through the American Educational Research Association Special Interest Group Teaching Ed Psych. For many of us, we're the only person on our campuses who teach the course. So um, the community of practice is really a great way to connect. So our group, our discussions began around the idea that we really wanted to take advantage of the open source format to collect uh, materials that we could use instead of those $120 textbooks that change edition every two years. I think our other presenters mentioned similar concerns. Um, we were very lucky in that one of our members, Kelvin Seifert, had published a textbook, an open access textbook on educational psychology with um, Rosemary Sutton. So we agreed to start there and then add in links to videos and articles, sort of a textbook plus that was more interactive and kind of blurred the lines between a textbook for a face-to-face -face course and online content for the online course, similar to what I think Donna was talking about. Okay, so uh, it soon became clear though, because we were from different institutions, that even though we all taught the same course, at least in title, our institutional needs were very different. Um, and we had a tough time moving forward. So um, at one point I proposed that we choose a small number of topics that we uh, all teach, develop the modules, and have our core group review the modules and then use them in our courses instead of assigning those chapters from the text for those particular topics. And we were able to secure the grant from College Open Textbooks and we used it to hire um, a technical person to convert our documents and links and everything and uh, give it a consistent look and then we published it in Connections. So um, here are the three modules that we put together. I did the um, motivation module and my colleagues Brian Beitzel and Nathan Gagne from SUNY Anianta in New York put together information processing and introduction to assessment. I just uh, wanted to show you a screenshot of uh, some of the material that I developed with the motivation module. I just wanted to point out some links that I added to take advantage of the more interactive um, nature of the electronic source. So the first link is a, uh, is a link to a flash animation that one of our members, grad students, put together to illustrate the concept of self-efficacy. And it's just a quick illustration that adds multimedia, kind of an interactivity, uh, something that a traditional textbook can't do. The other is a link to a glossary that I created. Um, in this particular topic, motivation is huge. And my material is pretty extensive, and not everyone will want to use all of the material in their courses. So what I did was split the chapter into sections, which are distinct modules. And then instructors could decide which modules they wanted their students to, to view. So 2, 3, and 6, 1, 2, 4, et cetera. And because of this, it didn't make sense to define the terms as they came up because we did, wouldn't necessarily be reading the initial, um, the initial module where the term was defined. So like Wikipedia, I put a glossary together with, um, with links so that when the term comes up, regardless of what section you're in, the reader can click on the link and see the definition of the term. So um, here's how we assessed the pilot project. We obviously wanted student feedback on the online materials. And we came back as a group of instructors to share our experiences. But we also wanted to attend to the bottom line, do the materials that we put together facilitate the learning of the concepts. So Brian and Nathan and I taught our courses and uh, assigning the modules in place of the textbook chapters. And as we came back to discuss, we all agreed it was a very positive experience. Informally, I know when I referred to the materials from the open source, or examples from the open source materials, I really got the sense that students had read the material and never a guarantee with college students. Um, and that they grasped it, so that's a good thing. Um, and so to assess student learning, we used our current assessments. Uh, for example, I have a quiz on each topic, 
And so I compared quiz scores from the previous semester with this current semester. Um, and there were no significant differences, but rather quite steady, which is fine by me. <laughs> Oops, I think I uh, skipped, a, I skipped a slide. Uh, the, when we asked the students their opinion, uh, a large majority, 88% of students preferred the online readings over the textbook. Um, naturally, as you'd expect, we had some people who prefer that have, to have that real book in front of them. So um, we also asked students about their, uh, the, how they favored the briefer reading, uh, where we could target the exact specific topics we wanted to teach. And students preferred that as well. So these here are our core group members. And uh, as you can see, they're kind of all over the place. Um, we had several uh, retired folks, as well as uh, the rest of us were from four-year institutions. Um, so the community of practice was a great way for us to connect and also for us to um, contribute to the development of uh, an online and open source text without actually having to write the whole thing ourselves. Uh, so the question, um, what platform are you using to contain the text? is uh, Connections. We, uh, it's the online repository, open access repository. Um, at my university, our learning management system is Canvas. So um, I hope that answers your question, Rick. And then Jim, uh, students uh, were expected to read the textbook on their own. Uh, so. They, I don't know exactly what format they used. I'm assuming they could use all three that you mentioned, computers, tablets, or smartphones. Any other questions? Oh, um, hi, Una. I'm not sure I'm clear on your question. Uh, I'll take a I'll take a, a try at clarifying. Okay. Uh, I had a very similar question. I think it's interest probably of interest for all of our groups how they communicate among themselves. And um, so you you have a platform where the content is, but then you have a widely diverse uh, and widely separated group. And how do you are, are there any particular platforms other than, for instance, email that you all use to communicate among yourselves? Yes. Uh, OK, now I get it. So we had monthly uh, web meetings similar to something like this, where we joined a session and uh, were able to talk among ourselves. And Una was our uh, facilitator uh, for, for most of the, the work that we did. Thank you very much, Lisa. We appreciate that. Uh, we have a few moments remaining. And if there are any other questions, please type them into the chat. I'd like to ask our panelists, uh, we've touched a little bit about uh, on this, but one of the ongoing concerns, I think, about OER is about um, quality of, the, of, the, uh, of what we produce. And as I said, we've heard a little bit about the role of the community in peer review, which is, of course, uh, incredibly important in the academic arena. Uh, anybody want to weigh in a little bit more about um, how the uh, communities can fill that need for peer review as we try to develop production quality uh, OER? Yeah, I can take a stab at that. This is Lisa. Um, I think that's an incredibly important piece of it. I think I know Maria mentioned the um, the aspect of tenure and, and the requirement for scholarship, and that was a concern of mine as well. So it, it is really important to have colleagues 
review your work. I know personally, I um, before I found out about this group, I had constantly grumbled about, well, I should write my own textbook because I'm so sick of these, you know, they change two lines and then go to a new edition and charge you more money. And uh, But the, the task was overwhelming. And, you know, who am I to say that I could do any better job? The other thing about published textbooks is they, they have to be all things to all people. And what we quickly found out was that, um, you know, we didn't even use most of what was in our textbook, not most, but a, a vast a portion of the textbook is not something we would use. So, so um, having colleagues to review our modules, we, we reviewed our modules, um, that, that's an important piece. That's also scholarship in and of itself as well. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, 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 just as a, a little comment on this, Charles, this is Muria. Um, we were able to get uh, Assistance from Orange Grove Publishing, which is the University of Florida's open source wing of their press. Uh, and they were the, actually able to facilitate the review process for us. So we were able to get somebody to get several reviews through them in a double blind peer review process, which gave the, the text itself a, a layer of legitimacy, at least in the eyes of our administration, for us to consider this, you know, a real text, quote unquote, real text, uh, and for me to be able to place it on onto my CV as a peer-reviewed publication. Um, this is Regina. I'm going to jump in here for a second. I think because again, I have a very different situation, being career technical education. Um, ours goes back to our industry partners. You know, we need to put students out that have the training and the knowledge that our employers and industry partners want them to have. So our review process is a little bit different and having had Mike be part of the industry and still work in industry and teach for us part time, we're able to straddle that fence very well um, with the support of our part time faculty. Uh, the hurdles for us come from funding to be able to pay our part-time faculty for the amount of time they spend helping to develop these materials and vet these materials within industry. So, um, so we have a very different process being a career tech ed program. We're coming to the end of our hour now. I want to thank uh, all of our panelists for participating today. Uh, from, from all of these uh, presentations, we heard some pretty impressive amounts of money that have been saved by adoption of OER for their respective students. Uh, we've heard various uh, kind of aspects of, of uh, communities of practice. We've heard about industry uh, representation in the community. We've heard about student representation in the community. We've heard about a community that is, is actually international in scope. Uh, some of our communities are within a particular institution. Some of them uh, go across various educational institutions. But I think the one thing that I get, uh, have heard from all of our representatives today, is that the community of practice is playing a real role in helping them produce peer review and uh, drive adoption of OER. And um, I would like to thank everyone who has tuned in today. I especially want to thank the staff of Open Education Week for all the work they've put into this, making all of these uh, webinars uh, available and, and uh, such a great lineup of them. Um, I will refer you to our final slide here. This is our contact information at Open Doors Group and College Open Textbooks. We are actively supporting community of practices and intend to do that. And if you'd like to be involved with us, we we encourage you to reach out to us. We are a collaborative. We have room for everyone. And um, we're, as I say, we have uh, Margarita and Kathy Hooper who are now uh, engaged actively in promoting our communities. And uh, we are very much interested in, in um, uh, spawning and supporting more groups around more academic disciplines. So again, I'm Charles Key for the Open Doors Group. And we thank you very much for having joined us today. And we're going to sign off now. Thank you.